Hepinize merhaba. Muhafaza etmekten eğitime. Hello everyone. Welcome to this panel. I'm from Preservation to Education, working with Testimony. Today we're with people who are doing very inspiring projects from the Los Angeles area. Three representatives of the USC Shoah Foundation are with us, and we're delighted to have them among us. To briefly talk about the foundation, the USC Shoah Foundation and Institute of Visual History and Education. was founded after the completion of Steven Spielberg's Oscar award-winning movie Schindler's List because at that time he had collected so many testimonies for the film. Initially called the Shoah Visual History and Survivors, the foundation went to cooperation with the University of the State of California to assume its new name. Those who witnessed and survived the Holocaust show started recording their videos, and between 1994 to 1997, they gathered 52,000 testimonies. And now they are also leaning on testimonies of other genocides and Holocaust with 55,000 testimonies in their visual archives. The testimonies and experiences are very important, and keeping a record of those serves purposes beyond documentation, raising awareness, fighting racism, anti-Semitism, hatred, and discrimination. It plays a great role in all of this, and with their innovative work, the Shaw Foundation is offering wonderful service to these purposes. I think actually had an article titled, Through Those Who Have Remained. And where he talked about looking at the importance of history through the eyes of those who lived it, those who survived it, and the Shaw Foundation's efforts show us that those who were the victims of different massacres and genocides in the past also tell us how they withstood those conditions by sharing their stories also sharing their mechanisms of resistance and resilience. By way of which becoming a hope and a cure for people who are the subject of such massacres across the globe. We have three guests and I won't be taking too long before leaving the floor to them. Our first speaker is Corey Street who is the program and operation senior manager of the Foundation from the University of uh, Toronto in Ontario. She has completed her master's degree there in 2001. She obtained her doctorate from Victoria University, an academician teaching nonprofit works, entrepreneurism, international business uh, at the Montreal University. And with her education and the scholarships she's received, of all good consideration to all of that. She has been awarded a, the Superior Economics Award by the University, and since 2011 she has been serving in the Shaw Foundation. In 2011 she started with the Foundation as the Training Director and the award-winning Eyewitness Platform, and uh, the Developing Testimony Program, which reached over one million teachers and students in 89 countries. She helped pioneer that. Right now, she is the Senior Manager for Operations and Programs, and she is responsible for HR budgets besides all the academic and global training programs, and I now leave the floor to her to talk to us about the background of the Foundation and the innovative methods and technologies that they utilize. And just one note, we will have a short break. After our two speakers speak, we have a 10-minute break following that, and then we will continue with our third speaker in the Q&A session. I leave the floor now to Corey. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for inviting us. We're delighted to be here, um, and I'm looking forward to snow tomorrow yeah. in Istanbul. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight uh, is to introduce to you how we provide access, 
to the important stories from the Visual History Archive, which is the world's largest audiovisual archive of um, testimonies from those who survived or witnessed genocide, including the Holocaust, and other crimes against humanity. So tonight we're going to just introduce you to the Shoah Foundation at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and then give you a brief overview of collections and access processes before we turn to a larger discussion of some of our education programs and introduce you to some of our new technologies. So the image on the last slide was one of our newest collection, which is that of the Rohingya, who we met with in a refugee camp in Bangladesh. Our purpose is to take testimonies like those and the others in the archive to help us develop empathy, understanding, and respect through testimony. So you'll notice in that mission, this is about hope and action and thoughtfulness but it's not particularly about any particular history or historical moment. It's not about any particular discipline. It really is about how we take human stories and use those to humanize each other and counter the kinds of othering and tribalism that can lead to identity-based hatred. And as those manifest, those can lead to more violent actions such as genocide. Our foundation started on the back lot of Universal Studios with Steven Spielberg following his completion of the award-winning Schindler's List. When the film won the Oscar, he made the statement that these voices of the survivors needed to be captured and preserved in perpetuity so they could be used to teach tolerance um, to all students all over the world. And so we embarked on this massive program of collecting testimonies or life histories of survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust, and then we expanded that process. Um, this film gives you a little bit of information about who we are today and what we're doing. You hear it passing? It's all we have, time, and one another. We look back in time and we look forward too, but the only time we can act is now. Now is the moment we live and talk and share and laugh and cry and hope and dream. Never before have we communicated with each other so much in the history of our species. Technology helps with that, but it is not technology, rather our need to understand each other that drives us. And so we gather up our memories everything that makes us who we are. The past is a part of our present too. It shapes us, forms us, good times, bad times. In 1994, we began a race against time to document the life. past. This is the first time that I really talk about it. There was urgency because a part of the human story was disappearing as survivors of the Holocaust began to leave us. One by one, we knocked on doors, sat in homes, talked on camera from morning till night. We went to 56 countries and talked in 42 languages to 50,000 people, witnesses to the worst times in human history, a point in time when we lost sight of the sanctity of human life. Women, children, men, partisans, saviors, liberators, Jews, Christians, homosexuals, we spoke to them all. Men and women who in old age were courageous enough to tell us their story of sorrow and survival. Faces, places, names, a library of humanity. They spoke about food and festivals, sports and vacations, houses and synagogues, weddings and pets and friends and family. Do you see them? Just ordinary people living ordinary lives. And that's the thing about genocide. It's not so extraordinary. It's created by ordinary people making extraordinarily bad choices about how they will treat other ordinary people just like them. And it can happen anywhere. Yes, I did say, anywhere. Hatred and genocide is a human problem. 
a global problem too. We need to hear the human story from around the world and across time. And so we travel to Armenia and Cambodia and Rwanda and Guatemala and Nanjing and China, and we gathered up the voices of humanity. We heard how much pain we share, how much strength we have, how much hope we can find. That hope lies firmly with the next generation. We owe those who told their stories a debt of gratitude for shedding light on our human condition. If we teach them and empower them and encourage them, the next generation will play it forward, speak to the courage of humanity. You know, we look back at the past, sometimes with wonder, other times with regret, shaking our head about how they all got it so wrong. But what makes us so sure that we would have done better faced with the same circumstances? We can have all the computational power in the world, but if we don't invest in our values, then what's the value of all of that? Hate is not a part of human nature. It's a, it's a learned behavior. It is based on suspicion and fear of the other. And so that's where we all come in. We can be smarter, put more of our skills into solving real world problems, bringing people together. Like the simple telling of a story where if we take just a moment of our time and listen to people, people just like us who have learned the hard way just how important the values of respect and dignity, the quality of trust really are, we can share that everywhere. Play it forward. Now. Now. That fragile moment between past and future. It's the only time we have to inspire respect and overcome the fear that divides us. Now, it's time. Time. So how we do that, how we inspire and we share the stories is through our visual history archive. And the archive was the way that we collected these materials, either through taking the testimonies ourselves or working with partners to bring in their collections. And it might surprise you to find that we have testimonies from Armenia, Cambodia, the Central African Republic. We have testimonies about contemporary anti-Semitism and the violence that we're seeing in Europe and North America of late and in Latin America. We have testimonies from Guatemala, from the Holocaust, which is our largest collection still, the Nanjing Massacre, the Rohingya, what are we having this problem today? Um, Rwanda, the testimony against the Tutsi in Rwanda. We have 55,000 testimonies and we, and in 43 languages. And we use those testimonies for scholars, for global outreach, working with partners like CNN to extend and make people aware of these human stories because humanizing each other will counter the othering and the hatred that continues to plague all of our communities. So that's how we inspire respect, understanding, and empathy. And I'm delighted today to be joined by two of my colleagues from Los Angeles who are real experts in both the archive and the acquisitions, the access process and indexing that makes everything accessible, and to talk to you about global education. Because global education is a way that we go out and we work with educators and students worldwide in some 32 countries actively, and we have use of testimony-based education in 90 countries. We have thousands of teachers and millions of students using these stories to think about what it means to be respectful, courageous, critical, to show leadership in humanizing. And we work with students from kindergarten right through university, formally and informally. And we work with adult learners, all of it based on testimony. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Manuk, who's going to talk to you about the archive, the process of indexing, and some of our more recent work. And then after the break, Seta will talk to you about education, and then we'll talk about some new technologies. But that gives you a sense of who we are. The last thing I really want to talk about is our theory of change. We work at a research university in Los Angeles, and often nonprofits will tell you about the great work they're doing, but they can't entirely explain why or what they're doing. We spent a good deal of time in the last three or four years really thinking about the behavioral change that we want to see in the individuals we work with. So whether that's a scholar, an educator, a student, a community member, an organization, how do we see them change? 
and how can we measure that? That's the only way we know the work we're doing is having an impact. So we thought about the problem that we're trying to deal with. How do you counter hate? How do you resist genocide? Well, we know that all of the kind of elements you see in the red balls, ideas, interests, and intent, are part of the problem. So I might have the idea that you're different than I am. And because you're different, you're the other, and then I start to attribute characteristics that are negative. Having those kinds of ideas may be part of what I do and how I act, but they also might not, I might not be conscious of those ideas, but I might benefit from interests, better education, more access to services, m different laws, those interests that get manifested in social, political, and economic ways. I might really benefit from those, even though I'm not conscious of being supporting the ideas that are undermining those interests. But then I also may never show intent to act or be violent, but I might. But it's not a progression, but all of those things have to be pre present when we see identity-based hatred and then its most horrible conclusion in, the, in, in genocide. So we can look at how we intervene through the use of testimony, whether it be in education or other programs. When someone uses testimony, they develop insight. They might have an aha moment. When they integrate testimony, they bring it into their classroom or into their research, and they make a change in their behavior that's more deep than just to turn it on, we see a level of commitment, and we can see how that manifests. But we also want people to contribute. We don't want them to just change how they're thinking or how they're feeling. We want to change how they're acting in the world. We want them to participate. We want them to participate in a particular way. Our outcome is to develop more courageous, curious, critical, respectful, understanding, empathetic, compassionate people. So all of what we do in our many programs is really about moving people through into that critical category. We have programs across education, access, research, and global outreach. In each of those areas, we have kind of an anchor program in research our Center for Advanced Genocide Research for um, one example with global outreach. We have our multimedia communications, which leads to the production of digital media in all forms. Um, tonight, we're really going to focus on education and access because we have two experts here. So they're going to uh, talk more about that. But I wanted to give you a sense of the level of programs. Last year, we reached about 16 million people through all of our different channels from Los Angeles. We work pretty internationally with a small team of fewer than 100 people. So I hope you enjoy learning a little bit more about access, particularly through indexing. And I'm going to turn it over to Menu. And I'm not sure if Nyad, are you going to introduce Menu? Can I turn it to you? All right. So that's part one. Uh, Man, we will continue with Manu Kavedikyan, who is a project expert focused on Armenian testimonies. He works on the integration of the American History Foundation into the visual archives and he has recently focused on the integration of another collection. Northridge California University Department of History uh, is undergrad studies and he got his master's in political sciences and we will hear about his work on the visual history archive. Um. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction, Nayat, and uh, thank you, Corey. Uh, to, give, uh, to give a basic explanation of how our archive works and what we do um, with, with it in general, um, I'd like to discuss the preserving the, the legacy component of our archive. So in parallel to the, to the 50 plus thousand interviews that the Shoah Foundation uh, gathered, we also have a parallel like initiative which, uh, which preserves, which we give importance on preserving uh, like interviews of other crimes of crimes against humanity. So, for example, other organizations that have that, that that have taken interviews, we we attempt to preserve that. We have a sophisticated approach in in preservation and restoration of tapes. So, when we get it, we have a very advanced software. Um, okay. Okay. <coughs> so, in uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so after we, so we have a process of taking in these tapes into our into the visual history archive. Uh, Corey, the next slide. Oh, I, I didn't realize it. Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, no, well, I didn't realize. 
Um, so the Visual History Archive, if you were to begin watching it to this moment uh, with all the 50, with all the 55,000 interviews, it would take you about 14 to 15 years to watch the entire archive. Uh, naturally, that would uh, most people don't have that time, but uh, we, I'm going to explain to you how we make that easier on you. Um, uh, we also, so the way that we make it easier is we make it easily searchable. So instead of watching an entire interview, we have indexing terms. We have terms that make you go straight to the minute, which I'll discuss further. Um, within that, within the archive, we also have uh, a base, like up, like over 700,000 images that are associated to each interview. Um, we also have thousands of names of people. So every time a person is mentioned within an interview, we we index it. We have all the information that we're able to have within that interview. Um, and we also try to make it, which also try to have a reach and make it accessible towards people, um, towards people around the globe. So we have uh, access sites specific to the VHA, to, to our visual history archive, uh, where you have total access to it at that various site. We also have VHA online, which is a much, um, which is a much more limited uh, version of the, of, the, of the visual history archive. And most people have access, to, anyone can have access to that um, via a, like a username and password. Um, this is the interface of the Visual History Archive. Um, you can see we have a collect, we have a list of all the collections. Uh, some of the ones that we've, some of the collections that we've taken, some of the collections that other organizations have taken. Should I speak slower? Yeah, okay. So we have, we also have, um, into, we also have, we also have archives of other organizations that have that have taken their interviews. Um, you can see them on the side. Um, all the various organizations that we've taken a Holocaust interview, uh, like Holocaust interviews, same with Guatemala, the Guatemalan genocide, and the Armenian genocide, which I'd like to speak f further, um, like about, which is my main focus. Um, so the Armenian genocide uh, archive that we currently have at the Shoah Foundation's or within the Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive is first of the Armenian Film Foundation, which was founded by J. Michael Hagopian. He was born in 1915, actually, um, in Elazug in Kharpert. Um, we His interviews were intended uh, for documentary film use, and it's a very international ar like archive. He's, he's traveled the world, Australia to Greece, to Syria, to Armenia, uh, but the, ma the majority is in the United States. Um, so we have, uh, currently, we have 333 interviews within um, this, this particular archive. And we also have, we, we also recently intook uh, the Richard G. Hovhannisian, um, like J. Hovhann like G. Hovhannisian, like oral history archive. Um, this is likely the largest Armenian genocide related archive, um, over 1,000 interviews. Um, they're only audio. Uh, however, they're very much longer interviews, um, and they deal very much about pre, uh, about the Ottoman Armenian life, about the about the genocide and World War One, and about the diaspora phenomenon. Uh, so they're very comprehensive, very very like very comprehensive interviews. Currently, we have done a pilot of ten interviews, um, and we're hoping to finish the full thousand uh, thousand plus interviews. Um, so this is a very this is a this is a newer um, component of the of our of our archive. Um, to recently to discuss indexing, um, I discussed it earlier, but indexing uh, makes it easy for a researcher or for an educator for anyone who is interested in the archive to to find material that they that they need. So when you get a book. Um, often, many people go in the back, they look for Armenia or Turkey or whatever topic uh, when it's a general history book and they find it may be in page 10, page 90, page 100, and immediately they go to page 90 or 100. Um, in instead of pages, we have minutes. So if we have 120 minutes, uh, each minute is coded or there's terms in each minute. So if you're looking for something about Adana or something about hunger, uh, you'll find it in minute six and you'll go directly to minute six and not waste your time with the entire, with the entire interview. Um, so we go minute to minute and we have indexers that focus on each minute and put the appropriate content uh, according to, like accordingly. Um, we also have other ways of finding these terms. For example, we have places. Anytime, a, any, anytime an interviewer, like an interviewee, uh, mentions a place, could be a birthplace, could be somewhere they worked, 
could be a deportation route, could be really anywhere and anywhere, does not matter. We index it. So on this map, as you see, um, for example, in this in this area, we have uh, we have Arab we have Arab Gir, um, or El Azog in the south. Um, each what was that? Uh, so for example, for example, here we have Arab Gir, and it shows that we have four interviews that are associated to to this place. Um, here they are Aram Aznavurian. Uh, I can't read the name. Ofsana Shavarshuni, Ayu, John Kupalian. Um, so each person has mentioned this place either for five minutes, for 10 minutes, or for 30 seconds. Uh, you would have to go in and figure it out. They may be from there, they maybe have passed through, uh, from probably from Erzurum, but it depends on, it depends on what, um, what the content is. So we try to make it easily accessible. Uh, naturally, for an international audience, we have another approach where, we, where we've translated all the interviews. Uh, the majority of the interviews are the majority of the interviews are, um, are in Armenian. Um, there's many in English because of the collection speci specific specificity. Um, but so as you can see, uh, we've been able to translate and subtitle uh, the Armenian interviews, the Turkish interviews, Arabic. Many, much of the Arabic is from Halep or from, Kam or from Kamishli or Derzor. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Bedouin Arabic. This is very difficult to translate and find somebody uh, to, to translate it. Maybe not in Turkey today, but I'm sure there's many people from all over Syria, unfortunately. Uh, and we have a lot of rare dialects. Rare dialects from the Hatay region, uh, from Mush, uh, from, from even from Diyarbakir. Uh, the hardest ones are from Musada and uh, Mush. Those are very difficult to understand and very hard to find translators for. Um, same with Arabic, same with Greek. Uh, we have neoclassical uh, po uh, 1800s Greek that was created just for the Republic of, of, of Greece. Very formal, very difficult. I don't think anyone speaks it anymore. Um, um, so we have these interviews. One of them, uh, this, is an, this is one, uh, one short clip I'd like to play. Uh, for example, if there's any ethnographers, any musicians, uh, they were, want to learn about music in the archive. Uh, for example, you can write musical recitals and you would go straight to this interview. Um, so for, please play it. So this is shot 1988 in Aleppo. Um, she's from um, she's from south of Aintab, um, and she's this this is this is the most common uh, requiem song that you'll hear within the archive. We have probably five six different versions of this same song, different lyrics. She sings it the best, um, but this is one of the things that you could find within the archive, uh, and um, this is one of the things that you can find, and uh, it, it adds it adds a breath of fresh air, various uh, quite a wealth within the archive that uh, can be quite surprising sometimes. Um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. Thank you for uh, my to the translator. I've been speaking very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, we can continue. So we will continue with Seda. And um, Seda, uh, Seda will talk to us about the eyewitness education platform, a very successful platform. And you'll hear in a while how it's had a transformative effect and how testimonies can be used for different purposes. This application actually shows that quite well. I'll introduce Seda. 
Uh, she's on the education team at the USC Shara Foundation, education and social assistance expert, and she gathers educational content regarding the Armenian genocide. Dela Marmont, you, Faculty of History and Master's Degree at US Arbin. Also, uh, a certificate in social studies. Developing online curriculum project based learning are some various educational methods that she has experience on. She's also a volunteer at the Armenian American Foundation, and I now leave the floor to her. Thank you, Nayat. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, so I would like to discuss uh, the global educational aspects of the USC Shoah Foundation. And mainly our educational platform um, consists of a wide variety of content that's very wide ranging. And it exists on our educational website called Eyewitness. So this is the homepage of Eyewitness, where you'll be able to, once you go to eyewitness.usc.edu, you can go through multiple different plat platforms, uh, pathways, to access our information. Um, but our, so Eyewitness uh, consists of about 2,800 2, testimonies that from the Visual History Archive. So from those 55,000 testimonies, we have this um, amount on our eyewitness platform um, that's accessible to students and teachers. And we, um, at the moment, um, about 90 people from 90 different countries access this information on eyewitness. And this includes educa uh, educators and students. And the numbers um, actually tell us that about 148,000 um, people use this um, from different parts of the world, as we see. Um, 90 countries. And um, our 90, 90th country was Armenia just a few days ago. And so, with this being said, um, our content is rooted in testimony, as we have been focusing on so much, of course, um, testimony-based education is at the heart of everything that we do, and it is at the heart of eyewitness. So our content um, is, a, is provided for multiple different grades, um, ranging from kindergarten through university levels. So um, our content is also um, so as you can see, uh, the different pathways in which you can access this information is available on what we call our watch page, which consists of multiple different topics um, that you can access curated clips of testimony. You can search through photographs that um, portray people identity, that portray people, um, people's lives from before, um, during, or after um, incidents of atrocities. And also our activities library consists of ready-to-go classroom materials. And our global programs page provides educators and students a way to um, easily access the content that they need um, as just another extra um, way of being user friendly. And you can see here that we also have um, eyewitness available in many different languages. And from behind, you can see examples like eyewitness Hungary, um, eyewitness Espanol, or um, eyewitness in Rwanda, which is in the Kinyar Rwanda. So um, with this, um, our content is digitally engaging for students. It allows them to uh, connect to, to another human um, by listening and uh, build their transliteracy skills. So by watching, by listening, their ability to speak or their ability to read text and listen increases as well um, by watching testimony. And with this, it develops their social emotional learning as well, because they're listening to another person and they're relating to that story. And ultimately, they are seeing and listening to um, connect with their own story as well. So 
so our, again, our testimony, our content is rooted in testimony, and um, we make sure that it is based on the latest theories in education. And uh, we also make sure that our content, uh, when students are engaging with um, our content, they are producing our learning outcomes. And so there is a goal that we have, and we want to make sure that students are reaching those goals. And we evaluate um, in uh, the, the student experience in the classroom to make sure that we are meeting those goals. And a very special aspect of our uh, programs are that we um, localize the materials that we produce. So based out of whatever, whatever um, environment, uh, what an environment, whatever the teacher needs within the special environment in which they teach, we want to make sure that the content that we provide them is accessible to their students, um, the themes that and um, content that their students need is met, is localized for the needs that they um, are looking for. So we would like to demonstrate an example of this um, testimony, um, testimony-based education. So just as Manuk showed you one of a, a clip from our, our collection, uh, but I, we are going to show another clip from our um, collection from the Armenian Film Foundation. But the clip that you'll see is of Arshak Dikranyan. He actually um, was born in Izmit in Turkey in 1905, and he was interviewed by the Armenian Film Foundation in um, Los Angeles, California, in the 1980s, I believe. And so, you'll wa as you watch, I uh, would like you to um, pl uh, in pay attention to the tone of voice that he's using and watch his body language as he's speaking as we watch this clip of testimony. One day, we were desperate, hungry, didn't know I had money. My father, we had a small rug that had a little value, and my father took the rug, and he took me with him too. And by bribe, we got out of the this Konya station and went to the flea market to sell the rug to buy some, to have some cash money, buy some bread and things like the provisions. We went to the flea market. My father opened the rug, on the, on the ground and was waiting for a customer. A Turkish gendarme came with uniform. He took a fancy to the rug and he wanted to work himself without paying. My father refused to give, saying, Efendi, çocuklar için buna ekmek alacağım. Acdılar, his children were Ophelia, sir, uh, this is for my children. I, I want to buy bread for my adult money. I did this to sell this. The man got, the policeman got angry. He says, get out of here, you gaver. Uh, 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 so my father had to wrap up, uh, roll the rug, and uh, went to a few further out, a couple of blocks away, and he opened the Work again, still waiting for a customer. This man, policeman, was watching him. He followed my father and hauled him out from the uh, chest and said, Ulan Gavr, son of Sikhti, me. Okay. All right. Survivors, are you ready, Michael? Yeah, you ready? Yes, roll it. All right. Go ahead. Survivors, R.T.D. Kranian, scene 46, take 7. Okay. Okay, Archie. Ulan Gavur, siktir ol buradan. Sana demedim mi yasak, yasaktır burada sokmaya. And he held my father from the throat and slapped one on each side, strong slap. My father looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, son, he says, you see this, don't ever forget it. And to this day, I haven't been able to forget it.
So um, as you can see, our content develops understanding of specific historical moments in which our survivors live through, but also our, con our testimonies can also speak to universal experiences that can bring about more inclusion, empathy, and compassion for others. And so this particular clip of testimony, not only is it accessible by itself, um, provided by biographical information of our survivor, um, where students can um, critically or analyze the testimony, it's also used in, an act in a ready-to-go activity um, that students can assign to teachers. And this particular particular one. Um, the activity that it's within is called What's Going On, um, that uh, allows students to an analyze a, a song from the United States uh, written by a famous singer, Marvin Gaye, and he, they analyze his song What's Going On that really talks about what's going on in his world, which was in the 1970s. And uh, they do this through three different perspectives. They're um, analyzing it through dehumanization, prejudice, and war. And as they're analyzing this song, they're also uh, looking, listening to these clips of testimony. So Arshak Dikranyan's clip um, helps to bring about more understanding for the experience of dehumanization and what the consequences and causes are of dehumanization. And ultimately, um, by moving through um, this understanding, students then um, are empowered to write their own song. They're, and the purpose of that is to be able to communicate with others um, what they see is going on in their world and how they can create a difference in their world through their own testimony which comes out through their own song. So it, with this all being said, eyewitness and testimony-based education allows students to discover experiences of the past. It helps them to recognize how the past influences us in the present, and um, it empowers them to discover ways in which they can create a difference and uh, activate their civic and social responsibility. And so with that, um, in their community, is what I want to make sure I, I say that. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it back on to, to Corey Street. One day. We're going to hear Ashraf again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, I'm just going to wrap up before we, oh, I always forget the microphone. Um, before we show you some of the new technology, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we're leveraging new technologies to further the power of these amazing testimonies. Um, the image you see behind me is a picture of Lala. Lala is a virtual reality animated short that we built with um, a number of partners that focuses on themes like love being stronger than hate. If you remember at the beginning of the slideshow, you saw a young man in a virtual reality headset. He's in grade one, so he's about six. And he's watching La La, which is based on the testimony of Roman Kent, which introduces students to the part of the history of the Holocaust, but also to concepts around love and loss and resilience. So that's one of our virtual reality programs that we offer for use in classrooms using this new um, technology. One of the other ways we're embracing technology is by taking testimonies out of the classroom and off the computer and putting it on a tablet or a cell phone integrated with maps and images and text in something we call an iWalk. And an iWalk is available for adult learners who might be edutourists or students whose teachers might want them to engage these different areas. And so it's really about being in a physical geography of space and thinking about what it's like now, what it was like in the past, and listening to individuals tell their story about what they saw there, what they experienced there. This ability to humanize these places, to help students interrogate past and present, but also sometimes to consider the void. Much of what we know about memory and memorial places is that there is much missing from those places, whether it's individuals who in the picture of the Shoes Memorial in Budapest on the Danube um, evokes 
the many people who were lost and who were killed by being um, shot or pushed into the river. Um, but other spaces in Philadelphia or New York or Los Angeles, Kiev, the various regions um, where students can move about and learn about this history by looking at what's there, what's not there. Um, one of the powerful moments often comes when these sites are also, also the victim of um, uh, graffiti, hate-filled graffiti. So not only are things missing, but things have been um, defaced on the memorials. So it gives students a chance to really f reflect on these kinds of moments. Another program we have, Dimensions and Testimony, um, and we've brought our other, our other teammate, Pincus Gutscher, who you see here in the, the filming. Um, we wanted to think about what happens when survivors are no longer with us. How does the education and the conversation with them continue? So in this case, we've used filming technology that's deployed by movies that use CGI, for example, where we're filming using multiple cameras and lights from a 360 degree perspective. That's then processed, rendered, and stitched together so that it can be displayed in multi-dimensions. So if you have the right display system, you can see almost all the way around the individual and it's as if, using something like Pepper's Ghost, they are sitting with you um, in the room. Um, it's still a testimony. We call this an interactive biography. But in addition to how we filmed it and are able to display it, we also use natural voice processing technology so that instead of typing in a keyword, you simply ask the system a question. In much the same way, if you have an Apple mobile phone, you say, hey Siri, in this case, you're asking Pincus a question. We also did a virtual reality where Pincus takes you on a tour of Medanic, the camp in which he spent much of his time during the Holocaust, on his last visit to Medanic. This is his last time to go back and say goodbye to the family members that he lost there. But it's as if you are going on a walk, and this is a very common feature when you go to some of these memory sites where you have a survivor or a second generation, the ch children of survivors, as docents who take you around and explain what you're seeing. In this case, for all of those of us who can't get to Medanic, you can put on a headset and in a room scale virtual reality, walk around the space. Again, this is what we call a walking testimony. So it's not edited, this is still Pincus's testimony in the same way it is in Dimensions and Testimony. So we stay very true to the nature of testimony as an unedited source. This is why we have to help teachers and, and others know how to use them. This is someone's memory, a memory of a traumatic event um, of their life before, during, and after those events. Whether they're witnesses or survivors, it's important if we're fighting denial to be very clear on the the, the things that testimony can and can't do. But we do want to introduce you to our other member of our team, so if you just give me a second, I'll wake him up and see if he wants to talk to us. So we'll see if Pincus still works with the translator. Mm -hmm. Hi, Pincus. Hello. All right. Can you tell us your story? My name is Pincus Gutter. Uh, I was born in 1932 in Wuch. Uh, my, my, um, my, my family were made up of my father, my mother, and I had a twin sister. We lived in Wuch very happily. We were winemakers. Um, when the war started, I was eight years old, and uh, my father was almost beaten to death by the Nazis almost immediately within three weeks of them coming into Wuch. Uh, it was decided that we would go and join my father's youngest sister in Warsaw. So we went by train as Christians, and we were there waiting for our father, who took, about, took him about two and a half months to walk all the way. He used to walk at night and sleep in ditches and barns and in forests. Um, when he arrived, he um, uh, found a little apartment uh, in Warsaw, before the ghetto was formed, and uh, he started making wine from raisins in the black market, and this is how we made a living. My mother had a little kiosk, 
And then when the ghetto was closed, uh, that continued uh, for a little while. Subsequently, things got very bad in the Warsaw Ghetto, and um, the conditions were so bad that it was like a, an apocalyptic inferno is not even words that you can describe what went on in the ghetto. From there, in 1942, in July, the Nazis decided they were going to liquidate the ghetto. We didn't know immediately why, what, but we found out that they created a place called Treblinka where they were going to murder all the inhabitants, about close to half a million inhabitants in the Warsaw Ghetto. 100,000 had already died from disease, so there were about 400,000 left. Um, we, my father didn't trust the Nazis, so we were never ever exposed to a selection, despite the fact that we had all the necessary papers, they were playing games, that, so that you could actually, this, you weren't going to report it, you were going to report it, but they were playing games, and they used to kind of red cards, green cards, blue, whatever cards, and they used to kind of say, now these are not valid anymore. They used to invalidate them and try and people take people. Eventually, an armed struggle started in 1943 in, on Erev Pesach on the 19th of April. It started a, 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 an, an uprising. In the meantime, my father who hid us in ethics and other places, he and friends of his in the building built a bunker under the earth on the ruins, we stayed in that bunker for about close to three weeks. In the third week of May, uh, they were, we were called. We were sent to a camp on Baidanek, where I lost my parents and my twin sister. I was selected, after a couple of months being there, I was selected to work. And I worked in a place called Skarzysko Kamienne, a work factory. I was there for a year, also in horrific conditions. I then was sent to an ironworks in Poland to change the Chova. Again, things improved there, but they weren't very good. From there, I was sent to Buchwald, where things, if I hadn't been taken out by the company that, you know, I worked for all the time, I would have died from hunger because they didn't even feed us. Things at the end of 1944 in Buchenwald were unbelievably terrible. Um, I was then taken to a place called Kolditz. I was fortunate to be chosen to work in the kitchen. I was then there for about three months, taken on a death march, because half of us died on the way or were shot on the way, and I was liberated eventually in another camp in Czechoslovakia, Theresienstadt, by the Russian army on the 8th of May in 1945. So we filmed Pincus Guter, um, before for our two-dimensional testimony, but also again for the interactive testimony for seven days, for no more than five hours a day. He wore the same outfit for those seven days and sat in that position. And we asked him about 1,500 questions. Sometimes we had students talk to him, sometimes we had staff ask him questions, and we filmed his answers. And then in processing, we link his answers and against the questions that are, that are asked but we don't curate his answers. This is a testimony in the same way that all of our other testimonies are unedited. But if a student was to ask a question that's not appropriate, they'll get a different answer. So if I said, what's your favorite color? My favorite color is blue. Right. Because we know that young kids will ask that. But if we ask him, do you like pizza? Could you repeat that? Do you like to eat pizza? My favorite food is gefilte fish that I make according to the way my mother used to make it. Who's going to win the World Cup? I have no idea. <laughs> so we can anticipate the behavior of users a little bit and try to draw them back to, as if you're asking me questions, I don't know the answer, I'll try to do um, as if it's a, a person. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask Pincus? And you can say it in whatever language and we'll translate it and speak it and see if he has an answer.
Oh. Uh -huh. yeah. Maybe, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I couldn't wait for the microphone. <laughs> so I just want to, yeah, uh, I was curious about how he felt uh, about being in this thing. In this program. <laughs> in this right, program. Let's try that. Like, yeah, if he shared, yeah. What do you think about dimensions and testimony? I think this project is very, very important. It is important because it will, you will be able to not just read or see the testimony of people, but you will be able, whoever does this, and how many of these projects you do, these are the people of the future who will be able to engage with the individuals who are, who, who are there and who actually need to know what happened on a personal level. It will mean much more than just watching a video or just listening to a testimony in audio. The ages that he went through them, I mean, how did he remember what he went through? How do you remember what you went through during the Holocaust? What well, gave me the will to try to continue to live, I think mainly it was instinctive. You know, it was the survival instinct of a human being that strive all the time to exist and not allow himself, you know, to be killed or murdered. And it was a quite, it was also a thing of resistance. Uh, that's the way I believe that when you did everything in your power to stay alive, you defeated the ideology of Hitler. You know, Hitler wanted to kill all the Jews. And if you stayed alive, you resisted what he wanted to do. How do you remember everything? Do I remember everything that happened in the Holocaust? I would say that by and large, I remember everything that happened and I could actually chronicle it, you know, page by page, you know, from day one when, my, when the war started, right through the war ended. Of course, with some, you know, not, with not exactly everything, because, you know, some things are the same. But I think I will remember, I do remember everything pictorially. As a matter of fact, in the Warsaw Ghetto, I used to walk around and I behaved like a camera. You know, my eyes were the lenses, my brain was the celluloid that was actually recording all those scenes. And I think if, it, there were, if I had the ability, and if you asked me about some scene in the Warsaw Ghetto, I could project it to you on the, on the, on the, on the wall. Um, I would want to ask him, how did he move on after he set up his new life and is he hopeful about the future? Pincus, are you hopeful? I always feel hopeful. I always feel hopeful. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a pessimist about personal things because of my emotions and fears. You know, that I'm always scared about what might happen here, there, and everywhere. But by and large, about everything else, I'm very hopeful. If I wasn't hopeful, I wouldn't be talking to you or anybody else about my experiences. How do you move on after the experience of survival? Just repeat that, please. How do you move on after the Holocaust? It was extremely difficult. Well, there were times. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think that you can actually say, 
for the, as, as, I, as, as I say to myself, the first 10 years after the Holocaust, I didn't suffer, I had no problems, I was living in the future, in the present and the future, and I was doing what I believe a young man needed to do. It was a specific day in 1954 that I fainted having lunch and I started having nightmares. And I had to start coping with these nightmares. I didn't know how to cope with them. I didn't have any help from anybody. I then met Dorothy and that helped to a certain extent in the beginning. We were just getting to know each other. There were certain people that actually didn't think that I would ever become anything because I was in di dire trouble. I was a laborer. I, 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 I had never had any education. And it was through marrying Dorothy, getting help from medical profession sometimes. And the thing that I remember most is that at a certain period in time when I really was coping in a way which I wanted to, this individual said to me that he told, showed me a door and he showed me the little tiny split at the bottom which says not even a mouse could get through and he said, you managed to crawl through it and you're going to be okay. Any other questions? It's addictive. After having gone through all of that, what are his thoughts on anti-Semitism, which is currently on the rise? What are your thoughts on anti-Semitism today? It's difficult to believe that there is, but there is anti-Semitism all over the world. It is actually getting worse instead of improving. You know, after the Holocaust finished, you know, I, I believed, and, and I think most of the people, Jewish people that I knew believed that anti-Semitism was on its way out. Things people didn't become antisemites anymore or they won't become antisemites and, and, and the world has learned that what can happen with antisemitism. But today, it doesn't matter. Worldwide, this uh, antisemitic uh, ideology is being propagated in countries, for example, like Japan, where it never existed before, and even during the war, when Jews were in, in, in Shanghai under Japanese occupation, they weren't treated badly or no different to anybody else. But today, there are fascists who hate Jews in Japan and try and propagate anti-Semitism in that country. So I guess he has an opinion on that too. <laughs> Um, I was wondering uh, how many times have uh, has he told this story? Oh. <laughs> I don't know if he can count that high. Mm -hmm. How many times have you told your story? How many times have I been back to Poland? <laughs> no. How many times have you given your testimony? I was sent to Actually, I went through five concentration camps. Hmm. This is where, just as when you're trying to get your question answered by anyone, you have to think about how you word it. So we'll see if we can try one more time. How often do you give your testimony? Just repeat that, please. Hmm. Do you often give your story to students? In 1992. Hmm. Yeah. How many times have you shared your story? How many times have I been back to Poland? Yeah. Yeah. 
Clearly he wants to talk to us about Poland. I think the 1992 reference is when he started to give his testimony. When was the first time you gave your testimony? The first time I went back to Poland was... <laughs> yeah, well this is one of the things with technology is when we take the computer back, they will look at the question we asked and the response it gave and figure out what's happening with the algorithm that's getting the answer. Um, it's sort of like when I ask Siri in my Canadian accent to get me places in Los Angeles, I often end up somewhere else because it doesn't recognize the street names the way I say them. So it's part of the voice, um, the, the, the process. Every time we use the system, it gets better. So when we first started, he was about 86% accurate. Now he's closer to 95%. So when we get to further along, the system, just the more questions, the more updates, the, um, the more accurate the, uh, the interaction gets. Um, the system, for example, is now able to do follow-up questions. So if you asked him about his kids and then what their names were, he can tell you. Before it would have been, I'm sorry, I don't know, because he doesn't, the system wouldn't make the, the link. Now it does. That's all in the improvements of the system in the same way that the more you use your voice activation systems, the better they work as they learn about you and your patterns are established. Any other questions? Um, I, I wonder about what, uh, what he thinks about the reason of anti-Semitism anti today. So what, why what is, is it happening? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Why do you think anti-Semitism is on the rise again? Oh, that's very easy. <sighs> we are the Jews, the smallest minority of a group of people that call themselves something, which is the Jews. And we go back several thousand years. And in the beginning, we were persecuted for political reasons, for religious reasons, for many, many other reasons. And over the time, over all this time, it kind of got ingrained in the psyche of people in general, because, you know, we kind of like do, uh, tend to do that through our genes. I believe that. Uh, there is a, a kind of something that creates a situation where people who have never met a Jew, who've never seen a Jew, who've never had any Jews living in their own country or in their village will tell you bad things about Jews. So how does that come about? And the second thing is the world needs a scapegoat because it's always nice to blame somebody else for your own iniquity. So why not the Jews? Jews were called by the communist capitalists. They were called by the capitalist fascists. By the, by the fascists, they were called communists. And so it doesn't matter. What, whatever you want to do with a particular group of people, it's like today the, in Eastern Europe, the Roma, which their derogatory term is the gypsies. So if you want to, uh, I remember even as a child, in Poland, before the war, my grandmother used to say, don't go anywhere near the gypsies because the gypsies catch children and sell the children. Now maybe there was a case, or maybe they're not, I don't know. But the fact is that minorities tend to have this problem. And because anti-Semitism was so ingrained over thousands of years, it is very difficult to, to kind of um, to, to do away with it. It's very difficult to make it, you know, to, to change. Can you sing us a song? Shulam Aleichem, Malchei Ashulam, Malchei Elyon, 
מי מלך מלך הים לוחים הקדוש ברוך הוא בו יאכל לשולם מלכי השולם מלכי ליום מי מלך מלכי ים לוחים הקדוש ברוך הוא ברכינו לשלום מלכי השלום מלכי הליון מי מלך מלכי ים לוחים הקודש ברוך הוא צא אתכם לשלום מלכי השלום מלכי אבליון מי מלך מלכי המלוכים הקדוש ברוך הוא. אנקורי, just as a note, you also, this is me, it's me. Just as a note, you also produce hologram of Pinkus, right? And you also do Q&As in different institutions and museums with... Mm -hmm. So we have um, uh, exhibitions with the Dimensions and Testimony System in various museums around the U.S. and one in Sweden right now. Um, how he's displayed depends on the museum. So in Illinois and um, soon to be in Dallas, for example, they're using a system that makes him appear like a hologram. So even though no hologram exists quite yet, it is an almost 360. So it really looks like a person is sitting in the chair. Um, even on the two-dimensional screen, um, after a while you'll forget that he's not there. When I was in Australia recently, um, a participant in a program kept going into different rooms looking for where he was because she thought he was there with us and just in another room. So it is the, just because of the multiple cameras, the detail is so remarkable. It is really like talking to um, Pincus. We've done research with students using him um, and the system, and we compared how they interacted with him in a, a double-blind study with having a control group interacting with a survivor in person who had a similar look and similar story of experience. And the learning was the same. The only real difference was that the students who were working with the Dimensions and Testimony system were more comfortable and braver in asking their questions sooner than the students who were working with the other survivor. They took a little bit of time to kind of get up the courage to ask because he seemed in person more frail. But the other students forgot that Pincus wasn't Pincus, that he was a system. And so the, the learning kind of balanced out over the course of the evaluation. In both, every time we evaluate this system, the learning's very good, um, it's very engaging, and we see the same kinds of learning as with other um, experiences. Oh, I'm sorry, one no? more thing I sure. want to share and ask. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the song was beautiful, by the way. It was such a similar to our uh, mm -hmm. melodies, I think, from here. and um, I want to ask, actually, again, maybe it will be similar, but um, has he been involved in one of those like uh, we do here, like in, in, in conferences or like right now, uh, how we do? Like, has he been ever involved in such exper experience? Like, uh, he sees like how we react and how we question his mm -hmm. hologram. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. has he been ever, I mean, taught about it or mm -hmm. has oh, he yeah. ever experienced mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. ever been in, mm -hmm. in such a room like we, mm -hmm. we are right now? and yeah. how he felt, and mm -hmm. I don't know if how he shared his yeah. feelings. Um, to be honest, it's yeah, like, go ahead. It, because uh, like we, sometimes we laugh and like uh, mm -hmm. how he can not answer those kinds of questions and mm -hmm. it's kind of feels awkward or mm -hmm. weird to be honest, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I might be not very open-minded mm -hmm. uh, like uh, mm -hmm. um, about this project mm -hmm. maybe, but it just, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, uh -huh. Curious and I'm uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I'll ask the. I can answer that instead of um, bothering Pincus. We've we've uh, we've uh, exhausted him to the moment. But um, we did a a launch 
three years ago at Toronto's Holocaust Education Week, which is something in November where they bring a lot of students to a program. And we did programs for 800 students where they engaged with Pincus, and then they met the real Pincus at the end. So he came into the third version and watched the students ask him questions. And he's done that several times. Um, he's always very generous in terms of his experience when he can't answer something or when he understands that in the same way um, people have trouble answering questions that they will and it really, so he's not discomfited by it. He realizes he's probably more discomfited by the, the attention he gets as sort of the star of this. When the students met him, it was like they were meeting a movie star. So that's, you know, he's a very, you know, he's a lovely man, but a bit quiet. So that seemed to overwhelm him more than how they were asking questions. Um, the students, he's been giving his testimony to student groups since 92. Um, and, or late 80s, um, early 90s. Um, and it often, like, when students ask questions of a survivor in person, they often laugh or it, because they're uncomfortable, it's difficult material. Um, so he's nodding along with me. Um, but he feels really good about the system and the way it works. Um, it's, it's a process. We have a, um, uh, we have a lot of interaction with him and him in the system, and we've tested that um, because we have a number of survivors. And we want to make sure we're always very concerned about being ethical and, and meeting high moral standards with what we do and how we preserve the testimonies and how we treat the stories. Um, generally speaking, when it happens just in interaction, the students don't laugh when they don't know the question. They'll keep trying to ask the question, and then they'll move on. So, you know, we're... Um, uh, it, it's not, and they won't ask inappropriate questions. Like there might be one out of, when we did the program in Toronto, I think we had something like 400 questions and only two were kind of, you know, inappropriate. But that had more to do with the students, you know, trying to, you know, be funny as opposed to not respecting the, the individual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You know, it's what you do is mind blowing and very inspiring. And like what I feel when I watch these testimonies, the victims of the past they harness pain to power. They harness you know pain to action, and they encourage us. They empower us today, and they become agents of change. And thank you very much for carrying out this tremendous effort. It's not easy. And like you are running a variety of projects in, terms, in the field of education, the field of testimony. And each time I experience something with USC Shoah Foundation, I feel much more empowered and uplifted. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us.